This morning we have the privilege, again, as God's people, to come together and to worship Him in song as we've done, and now through His Word. And so we praise Him for this opportunity. We're going to spend our time together in 1 Peter chapter 4, so you can begin making your way there. 1 Peter chapter 4. We've already sung this morning about the living hope, Christ our living hope, and the Apostle Peter wrote this letter to Christians reminding them of the hope that was theirs because they had been born again according to the great mercy of God through Jesus Christ. And as they lived as Christians in the present age, they were at the same time to keep their gaze focused, their eyes focused on eternity. They were awaiting their inheritance, much like you and I are today, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for them. And so Peter encourages these readers to lift their eyes to eternity to stay focused on the Lord Jesus Christ as they await his glorious return. And it was imperative that they do so, and here's the reason why. Since having been born again, the Christians to whom Peter was writing were either presently undergoing persecution or they were preparing to undergo persecution for their faith. They'd be mocked for their faith. They would be marginalized because of their beliefs, maligned or verbally attacked for living out the truth. Life would be difficult for the Christians. And in these verses we're going to read this morning, Peter explains to his readers that trials will come to test them. And instead of being surprised by them, they should rejoice as they entrust their souls to God. And these words will prove to be a great encouragement to you and I this morning. Because like these Christians to whom Peter wrote, we've been called to endure suffering for the name of our Savior. And we should do so with joy. And so I invite you to stand if you're able in honor of God as we read his word together. We're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 4 beginning in verse 12. I'll read through verse 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved... What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. We praise you that you are our living hope. You've given us your word this morning. And so we pray for hearts that are tender tender to receive the truth. So come, we ask, be our teacher. We want to know you more. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. To be a Christian is to be born again. It's to be given a new heart. To be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Some years ago, there was a a, a young man who had lived the, the young years of his life for himself. 
and the happiness that he pursued in uh, his selfish lifestyle proved only to be an illusion. And instead of finding satisfaction, he found himself empty and, and weighed down with the guilt of his sin. And then something remarkable happened. As with each of us who have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, this man was moved to repentance. He was brought to saving faith by God's grace. For the first time in his life, he could truly rejoice. He'd been brought near to God and his sins had been forgiven. And he began to understand that true and lasting satisfaction was found in Christ and Christ alone. And as he rejoiced in his, his newfound faith, an older man, one who had been walking with the Lord for, for many years, approached him. And he said, I, I need to share something with you. He gave him this warning. He said, you need to know that you are now engaged in a battle. You have an adversary. He was quite content when you were living for him. But now that you have come to faith in Christ, he's seeking to destroy you. He's seeking to destroy your faith. You need to be aware. Life will be difficult for you. In the verses we've just read, we see Peter sounding a similar warning to the Christians. An exhortation given to them that is immediately relevant for you and I this morning. Trials and suffering are inescapable. They're an inescapable reality for the Christian. The trouble is that many of us do our very best to avoid any kind of suffering. That, or we find ourselves surprised by it, and we respond poorly. And so we ask the question, is there a way for us, is there a way for you and I to embrace suffering for the name of Christ? Indeed, there is. And this is what we see in these verses. You and I should rejoice in suffering. We should rejoice in suffering as Christians because when we suffer according to God's will, we understand that it's purposeful. Our suffering is is purposeful and it brings blessing. You and I should rejoice when we suffer as Christians because suffering according to God's will is purposeful and brings blessing. Let's take a closer look at this passage here together. And the first point for us to consider uh, may be summarized in this way. Do not be surprised, but rejoice as you share in Christ's sufferings. Do not be surprised, but rejoice as you share in Christ's sufferings. A a noticeable feature as we read through uh, Peter's first letter here is the number of imperatives that are given throughout this letter. When we think about an imperative, an, an imperative is a command. It's Do this or don't do that. And in verses 12 and 13, there are are two imperatives for us. The first is, do not be surprised. And the second is, rejoice. So let's, let's look at each of these. Look with me at verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Do not be surprised. Here's the imperative. Believers should expect to encounter trials as they live for Jesus Christ in the present age. In the beginning of this letter, Peter refers to these these readers as elect exiles. They were strangers. They recognized that the world that they were living in was not their final resting place. The same is true for you and I this morning. We're strangers, as it were. And so as as strangers in this this foreign land, we should expect trials, fiery trials. And here, this this phrase, fiery trials, it really should be understood as as a metaphor for the difficulty of the trials that we will encounter. 
Trials will come in, in, variety, in a variety of forms. We think about the nature of, of fire and uh, the, the way that heat purges impurities from an object. The Proverbs, for example, Proverbs 21 or 27, 21 says this, the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold and a man is tested by his praise. The crucible. Heat is applied. And as I understand it, the, the impurities from the silver, as, as heat is applied to this crucible, the, the impurities rise to the top and they're able to be removed and then what's left is this pure silver. That's the picture for us here this morning. The heat, the, the fiery trials come to test us, to purify us. We shouldn't be surprised at this. Instead, we should rejoice. Here's the second imperative. Rejoice. Does this sound strange to you? To rejoice in trial? To rejoice in suffering? It seems counterintuitive. Is it not natural for us to want to, to run from trials? To seek to avoid them? How then are we to do this? How are we to rejoice in trial? Notice the word that connects verse 12 and verse 13. It's this little word, but. He says, don't do this, namely, don't be surprised, but rejoice. Rejoice to the degree that you share in Christ's sufferings. Here we see the link. To the degree that we share in the sufferings of Christ, we're to rejoice. In other words, the, the more we live like Jesus and endure some of the same sufferings that he endured, the greater our rejoicing. Here's another example of the Apostle Peter in this letter calling us to lift our eyes off of ourselves to our beloved Savior. Let's consider for a moment some of the sufferings of Christ. How is it that Christ suffered? He suffered unjustly. He was treated as a criminal, though innocent. We can go back to the prophet Isaiah. And in Isaiah 53, he's writing about the suffering servant. The suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ who was to come. And in verse 9 of, of chapter 53 of Isaiah, we read, And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. He had done nothing wrong. And still he was punished. His mouth was only and always filled with perfect speech and yet he was falsely accused. He was falsely accused and suffered unjustly. Christian, have you considered that when you're falsely accused for doing right, for following in Christ's ways, when you're falsely accused, you're a partaker in the sufferings of Christ. Peter says, rejoice in this. Rejoice in this. We get a little glimpse of the pain that our Savior endured in order to set us free. And in this, we are to rejoice. Jesus also suffered by being publicly mocked and shamed. We read about this in the Gospels. The Gospel of Luke, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. Here we have the Lord of all creation, the one who put the very breath in the, in the lungs of those who would ultimately kill him. He stands before them and is, is publicly mocked. He's shamed, he's, he's humiliated as he's treated harshly in front of others. The Lord of creation. Christian, when you're mocked for refusing to compromise your integrity, 
perhaps at work, because of your commitment to your Savior, you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Young people, I can imagine a scenario where, where you're with a group of friends and it's decided among them that you're going you're gonna to watch a, a, a movie that you know is going to bring great dishonor to God. And because of your commitment to your Savior, you choose to walk out of the room and you're mocked for it. Rejoice. You get to participate a little bit in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice. Don't be surprised. Jesus always spoke truth. He said of himself, he was the truth. And we as his followers want to do the same. And when we do so and suffer ridicule, we should be, it, should, it should come uh, expected for us. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then we listen to the Apostle Paul in, in his first letter to Timothy. He said, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. What we understand is there is but, there is but one way. There is but one way to God, one way to receive eternal life and is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. This is the message of the gospel. It's an offensive message. The gospel is offensive because it exposes us. It exposes our sin. The gospel says we've rebelled against our creator. Simply by being born human separates us from God. We're sinners by nature and we rebel by choice. We're sinners by choice. The gospel shows us this and we find this, this message to be offensive. It exposes us as sinners, but it shows us that Jesus is the only savior He's the only hope for rescue for sinners. And when you and I proclaim the exclusive truths of a gospel, of the gospel, in a world that insists on inclusivity, we should expect ridicule. We should expect suffering to follow. Brothers and sisters, trials come for testing. And the way that we respond to those trials says something about our relationship with God. Indeed, we might say it's indicative of our relationship with him. Rather than being surprised by trials and seeking to avoid them at all costs, we should rejoice for the privilege of sharing in, with Christ in our suffering. The more we grow in love with our Savior, the more we will embrace suffering for his name as the highest of honors and privilege. And so, and so when we encounter fiery trials, we mustn't be surprised, but instead we should rejoice as we share in Christ's sufferings and we're able to share in his sufferings because of our, our union with him, because we bear the name Christian, which leads us to our second point, and it is this, do not be ashamed, but glorify God as you suffer as a Christian. Do not be ashamed, but glorify God as you suffer as a Christian. Up to this point, we have, we, we, we've learned that we should expect trials and we should, should rejoice as we share in the sufferings of Christ. The suffering that we undergo should be because of who we are as a Christian and, and not for doing evil. That is, things that would normally incur or, or bring about suffering. If we look again here at verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Again, this sounds counterintuitive to our natural bent toward avoiding suffering. Blessed for being insulted? Yes, says Peter, because God's spirit rests upon us, giving evidence that we are indeed God's people. But we must understand that our suffering should come because we bear the name Christian and not because we do wrong. He says, don't suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or even as a meddler. 
If we're making decisions that are evil, we should expect to suffer the consequences of those decisions. That's his point. It would be easy to understand how a murderer or a thief suffers the consequence of his actions. The same for the more general evildoer or even the meddler. The point being made here is that that believers who act sinfully should expect to suffer the consequences. Blatant sins like murder, stealing, to the less blatant ones like being a busybody, meddling in another person's business. We see that character matters as we read through Peter's letter. He's calling believers to pursue holy living in each sphere of their lives. Back in chapter 2, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We should suffer for bearing the name Christian, not for being an unruly person. A person who's, who's brash and boisterous in his interactions with others, maybe known around the, the office or around the job site as a person who talks a little too much, maybe about others too much. When this person attempts to share the gospel with others, people decide they don't want to listen to him. He should carefully consider his life before he concludes that he's suffering persecution for the name of Christ. If, on the other hand, a person is kind in his interactions with others, treats people with dignity and respect, does his job with integrity, and then proclaims the good news of the gospel and is insulted, this man, says Peter, is blessed. And furthermore, he shouldn't be ashamed. He shouldn't be ashamed to be called Christian but should glorify God in that very name. I'm reminded of the apostles in the book of Acts. Not so long ago, we were working through as a church through the book of Acts. And perhaps you remember this this story back in Acts chapter 5. The the apostles were arrested and put in prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord came and, and opened those doors and brought them out and told the apostles to go. To go into the temple and to speak to to the people all the words of this life. And so they did. Which caused further uproar. And they're brought before the high priest for questioning about their preaching and their teaching. And they responded in this way. We must obey God rather than men. And then if you remember Gamaliel, this, the Pharisee came and he, he warned the, the, the Jews about what they were going to do to the apostles. And then in verse 40, we read these words. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Here's an example of what Peter is saying. You're blessed for being insulted for the name of Christ. To be insulted for the name Christian, which simply means follower of Christ. Just last week, we heard testimony standing right over here. We heard testimonies from individuals about how the Lord had brought them out of darkness into his marvelous light. They stood before the church and said, in essence, I'm not ashamed of the Lord Jesus. I'm not ashamed of him. He's my Lord and he's my Savior. Brothers and sisters, the fact that we, are, that we will be blessed when we are insulted for the name of Christ should encourage us to humbly, humbly and boldly proclaim him. Consider the culture that you and I find ourselves in, 21st century in the West. And then think about, under this this broad umbrella of, of where we find ourselves in 2023, here in America, and then think about the specific spheres that the Lord has you, the job that you're in, the school you're attending, 
the team, the sports team that you're a part of, the council or the board that you sit on. Think about these particular spheres. What might suffering as a Christian look like in that sphere? What truths are under attack in those spheres? God's design for the family, roles of men and women in the church and in the home, masculinity and femininity, human sexuality and all that that entails. What truths are under attack? How might you speak truth in those particular spheres that the, that the Lord has you in? Elsewhere in this this letter, Peter instructs the believers to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks them for a reason for the hope that is in them. And he says, you must do so with gentleness and respect. Be prepared to give an answer and do so with gentleness and respect. How important it is for us to communicate the glorious truths of the gospel with gentleness and respect. By God's grace, we speak the truth in love. We hold fast. We hold firmly to the truth. We hold firmly to our convictions without wavering. And when we incur ridicule, For being a Christian, we don't cower in shame, but we glorify God. We give glory to him for bearing the name Christian. How might we do this? What does it look like for us to give glory to God when we're ridiculed for the name? Remember these readers to whom Peter wrote were sojourners. He calls them, as I've mentioned, elect exiles. The same is true for you and I. We're here temporarily. Our home is in the heavens. But we're called to live here for this time. And during our temporary sojourn here, we must understand that we must, we will suffer for the name of Christ. Several exhortations from Peter help us to understand how we may bring glory to God in our circumstances. Back in chapter 1, he says, we are to pursue holiness since God is holy. And so we pursue him. We live for him as we, as we proclaim him and incur ridicule. We're to keep our conduct among the Gentiles, among the world, honorable. We subject ourselves to human institutions. We fear God. We subject ourselves to our masters. Those who are in authority, we subject ourselves to them. Even the unruly ones, the unkind ones. And in so doing, God is glorified. We don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Instead, we follow the perfect pattern of our Savior. We return blessing. This is how we bring glory to God in the midst of our suffering. In short, we might say we're called to live in a way that is consistent with the name that we bear, namely the name of Christian. Why? It is because judgment, it's time for judgment to begin, so says Peter. And he says judgment is to begin with the house or the household of God. The trials and sufferings that we endure for the name of Christ are a means of judgment that, is, that the Lord is using to prepare us for eternity. And we need to be abundantly clear here at this point. The judgment of the believer is not one of condemnation. Romans 8.1, you're, you're, you're saying the verse even now. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We should understand this judgment, rather, to be one of purifying. It's it's a purifying judgment. 
God's judgment on his people, even now, is one of refining, purifying. As we're brought through the heat, brought through the fiery trials that test us, our faith is purified. And we learn to trust God more and more through them. The judgment for the believer is from the good hand of our gracious Heavenly Father. The one who sent his son to die in our place. To make a way for us to be reconciled to him. And so his judgment is good. It's as a father disciplines his child. The judgment for unbelievers, however, is one to be feared. Peter makes the argument here from lesser to greater. If God does not spare his own people from judgment, that's the lesser. How much more will those who have rejected God be judged the greater? We see this in verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Those who do not obey the gospel of God are those who do not believe the gospel. That is, those who are not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. If that's you this morning, I appeal to you, repent and believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus Christ came to earth as a man and lived a perfect life. Believe that he went to the cross and there he bore the wrath of God. He took on himself the judgment that we deserve for our sins. Believe that he died and then rose again. He conquered death and made a way for us to be reconciled to God. So ask yourself this morning, am I trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of my sins? Do you know that you can be saved even today? As you sit here, confess that you're a sinner. I have sinned against God. Believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Paul says this in Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The judgment of God is sure to come and it has begun with his own people, with the household of God as he's refining us through the fires of suffering, which is cause for us to rejoice and to give glory to God. Christian, do not be ashamed when you suffer for your Savior. Rejoice. We have the truth. We have eternal life. We've been made new and now are called sons and daughters of God. This leads us to our final point. Do entrust your soul to God as you suffer. Do entrust your soul to God as you suffer. We've come to understand that trials come to test us. We should expect to suffer for the name of Christ. And when we suffer in this way, we should rejoice because we're blessed by God who calls us by his grace. And while all of this is true, we, we affirm this in our, our minds and in our hearts. We recognize that the prospect of suffering can be a fearful one. Furthermore, we acknowledge that, that suffering is difficult and often we just want to find a way out. But the last verse of this passage this morning is one of great encouragement and comfort to the suffering Christian. Hear these words. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Those who suffer according to God's will are those who suffer for his namesake. And when we suffer according to God's will, we should entrust our souls to him. I don't know what the, the trials are that you're facing this morning. But the Lord does. 
And the word of encourage for us this morning is to entrust ourselves to the Lord in the midst of that. To entrust ourselves to God is to, is to give ourselves over to him. It means we, we willingly submit our souls to his care. Consider this simple illustration. Suppose you're planning to be away from home for two weeks. You're going to go on a two-week vacation. And you recognize that while you're away, there are some things that need to happen around your home. The lawn's going to have to be, uh, the grass is going to have to be cut. Somebody's got to take care of the mail. Somebody's got to tend to the dog and on and on. There's, there's a list of things. And so you go to your friend and ask if he's willing to keep an eye on for, out uh, on your home while you're away. And before you leave, you, you take the key to your home over to your friend's house and you, you put the key in their hand. In a very real sense, you're, you're entrusting the care of your home to your friend. The call for us is to, in the midst of suffering, entrust ourselves to God. Notice how he's described here, our faithful creator. This is quite significant. God is indeed our faithful creator. And as such, he, he rules and reigns over everyone and everything. Not only that, but he, by his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. And the one by whose power we are being guarded through faith for a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. This means that what God has begun in us, he will see to completion. This includes every act of suffering that you and I may be called to endure. So lift up your eyes, dear Christian. Rejoice. Rejoice for suffering in the name. Entrust your souls to a faithful creator. Believe that God is not aloof, but he's very near. And he will keep you. Believe that trials and suffering don't come by chance, but rather they're part of God's uh, eternal plan to conform you more and more to the image of his beloved son. Therefore, keep doing good in the midst of suffering and entrust your soul to God. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name this morning. We bless your name because you have called us to endure ridicule, to endure insult for the name of Christ. And so we pray that we would leave here as people who are emboldened to continue to proclaim you and that we would entrust our souls to you. Please help us. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.